Well, good afternoon. Just by a show of hands, how many of you have ever been to the Musk Observatory at MDRS? All right. So for the rest of you, this will all be new to you. My name is Peter Detterline. I'm the observatory director. And over here is Gary Becker. He's one of our great members on the astronomy team. Gary's going to give you a brief background on the observatory and astronomy at MDRS. And then I'm going to talk about some new changes that are occurring because the landscape of MDRS is different. A new science lab, new solar arrays, and now a second observatory. So let's start at the beginning. Gary? All right, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I got to tell you, there's a backstory to this talk. We thought we were presenting tomorrow. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, we, it took us 45 minutes to get from the hotel to, uh, to uh, Irvine this morning. It took us 30 minutes to go back, get the uh, flash drive, and bring it to the hotel for this presentation. Anyhow, how did this start? Well, really, uh, it began uh, in 2002, not 2001 with a $20,000 donation from Elon Musk to the Mars Society via Robert Zubrin. We, that is, on the Mars uh, astronomy team, got approximately $15,000 to put up an observatory at MDRS. Now, you might say to yourself, how do you put up a full-fledged observatory for $15,000? Well, first of all, you find a guy who's trying to get rid of a, a dome, OK? In fact, it was in his. Uh, driveway. Secondly, you get your telescope and your mounting system for free as a donation. Thirdly, you design your own furniture <laughs> for the observatory. <clears throat> so this was uh, the way it looked. We were on top of a small knoll, which was just outside of the MDRS uh, uh, building. And uh, this was the first image that was taken through that particular telescope. If we fast forward roughly 16 years into the future, 17 years into the future, well, here we are again, OK? But you notice the observatory is in a little bit different shape. Uh, there was a problem with the location of the observatory. And actually, this fisheye lens shot sort of exaggerates that particular problem. But we were on a hill, and we were in Badlands. And whenever it rained, uh, the Badlands shifted ever so slightly. And so the telescope building, uh, cement pad, mounting system, and everything were moving a couple of inches per year. So we had to relocate. And what we did is we decided to relocate down in more stable territory. And uh, you see us uh, putting up the dome, OK, of the same observatory. And that occurred in 2012, that, uh, that change from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill. So now there's a nice uh, concrete pad on the top of the hill. I often go up and observe from that location. And we have the observatory and much more stable footing uh, below. And so this was the summer refit of, I'm sorry, 2014, my mistake. And uh, you see Pete Detterline, the uh, lead astronomer in the back, the new MDRS Musk Observatory, uh, located about 150 feet away. Well, this was the. Uh, way that it looked, uh, the interior of the observatory, once we were located at that particular point. These are some of the images which we have taken with that particular telescope. And SIM teams have also taken as time has gone on. And of course, Mars. This was the last image that was taken uh, by the uh, Musk Observatory, the old Musk Observatory, I should say, because there has been a refit of that particular observatory. And Pete's going to get into that momentarily. But a beautiful image of M82 and M81 in Ursa Major. Well, the Musk Observatory dilemma. We received a donation uh, of about $62,000 for astronomy. There was $12,000 that was mandated to put in a solar observatory. And we had about $50,000 left for a new Musk uh, observatory. The problem was that the old Musk Observatory, uh, as we continued to do add-ons as time went on, uh, we had a situation where the learning curve was becoming greater. If we wanted to put in a new observatory, uh, it was going to be even more complicated. So we looked at the idea of a robotic facility, all right? And for a robotic facility, we needed a couple of things. 
we needed stable power. We needed state-of-the-art equipment, obviously, that could be run robotically. It had to be easy to learn, all right, and uh, we needed high-speed internet. And all of those things are coming together with the new observatory. Uh, with the refit of uh, the entire NDRS facility uh, outside of Hanksville, uh, you see the solar paneling that has gone in. And this past summer when we were there, in some of the hotter weather, uh, the interior of the observatory, uh, the interior of the uh, MDRS is not air conditioned. So we had a high one, one evening of 99.1 degrees Fahrenheit inside the building. But regardless of that, uh, we were able to, uh, uh, you know, continue working and continue working on the refit. Uh, the solution obviously was a robotic solution, okay, but there was another problem, okay, with that. And Pete was really the lead person in this. We, we tried in every way possible to build a robotic observatory for, for $50,000, which is what the leftover capital was with respect to uh, what, we, uh, what we still had after the $62,000 donation. But the problem was we couldn't do it for under $70,000. Well, I happen to be a teacher at Moravian College in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and I teach astronomy there, and I was looking for a remote site to do astronomy. Pete and I had been friends for, oh my goodness, uh, probably close to 40 years. And uh, I said to myself, well, I had $14,000 in the kitty. We needed $20,000 more. I possibly could raise through public donations an extra $6,000 and we'd have the $20,000 to convert the robotic, uh, to convert, uh, which would be a manually run observatory into a first class robotic observatory. Well, the check was mailed, I believe, in early April of 2017 and the robotic observatory actually became uh, a reality. I'm gonna turn it over to Peter now because he's gonna talk about the solar observatory, which was the old Musk observatory, which you saw in the pictures before. Pete. All right. So in the olden days, you'd go out to the Musk Observatory, you would open up the dome, you would get your cameras on or look at it visually, you'd take some images, something wouldn't work, you'd play around with that, you'd write to me, I'd try to find a solution. It, you know, it, there's a learning curve. There's definitely a learning curve to this. And we've always wanted a robotic observatory, but we're now looking at solar. Now I figured this would be really simple. We already have the infrastructure set for this. The mount is already there, the dome works, everything is perfect, there were no big problems except the little few uh, things with the uh, telescope tube we had to do. So we cleaned it up this summer and we made sure the mount was good, took the old telescope off, and we put on a brand new 100 millimeter Lunt Hydrogen Alpha Telescope. Now this is only for looking at the sun. If you go outside at night to use this, you will see absolutely nothing. It is not gonna work. It is meant for the sun only. It has filters built into it in all sorts of different places. It can't be adapted. But the sun is a good thing. We're looking for solar flares. We're always talking about that kind of stuff. So this works out really rather well. And really setup was easy. We take one telescope off, we put another on, we balance, um, we're done. It's now a solar observatory. Really important to know. It is safe to look at this thing visually. It is safe to look at this with cameras on it to take pictures, and you want to do both. Actually, once you get familiar with it, you'll be out there for about, oh, 20 minutes a day, half an hour if you want to take a picture of the sun a day. You're pretty much done. It's not that difficult to operate. So visually, we've got a nice eyepiece that's kind of a zoom eyepiece. You can go to seeing the entire sun to just a section. You want to begin there. You want to look at it visually. You want to find something really cool like a prominence coming off or a sunspot or some other flare type of feature, something that's going to be really fantastic to image. We have a covering for it. You can put that over your head so you have better contrast. You're in a nice dark environment to take a look at it. That's also on there, that's our cover for the instrument itself. But we also have a camera. It's a video camera. You're going to take pictures that are about 35 seconds long. In that time, you're going to capture about 2,000 pictures in 35 seconds. 
it's going to be taking at a very high frame rate, loading it onto your computer, and you're pretty much good for the day. You're done. What can we see? We're looking for flare activity. Obviously, off on the sun, we are looking for sunspots. We're looking for filaments. There we go which are prominences, these high looping gases coming off, looking straight down on top. You're going to see all sorts of different features for this. Here's some actual pictures taken through the telescope I took this summer, just testing it. And I have to tell you, this was on a horrible day with lots of clouds rolling in. It really was not cooperative at all, especially for this one. I just had clouds moving in. Couldn't even get 35 seconds of clear sky. But still, we got some pretty amazing images. And it's really phenomenal. It's 35 seconds or a little less uh, for each one. So it's rather easy to use. You're looking at the sun. We're going to be cultivating that. Research proposal. In the past, you have to have a research proposal to use the telescope. That was the big thing. I thought about this. What are you going to write? I want to look at the sun. I want to look at solar phenomena, maybe see flares. I get to write or listen or read. Um, Essay after essay on the same thing written 100 different times in 150 to 300 words, that, that's kind of silly. I know why you want to use the observatory. You want to look at the sun, you want to take pictures. No research proposal at all this time, not for this. If you want to use it, you're going to go off to the website and click on program information, then MDRS observatories. Scroll down, and you're going to find exactly what you need to do to get onto the training site. This is a new website, so don't use the old one. It's brand new. Click on to that. You'll have to make a new account, and you'll be in, and you can start your training. Once you log into the website, click on Musk Observatory. It'll open it up, and you'll find the Musk Observatory Quick Guide. That'll tell you how to do everything. It'll tell you how to open and close the dome. It's going to tell you how to operate the telescope. It's going to tell you how to take pictures and give you step-by-step -step examples from imaging to processing all the way through. There will also be a test online there. Ten points, take the test, you're ready to go. That's all there is to it. So that should take care of the solar. And that's going to be something that'll be kind of fun to go out. It won't take long. Won't be a huge part of your day, and definitely will be worthwhile to send a picture, an image of the sun as we take a look at what's going on at MDRS. Let's look at the new observatory. Thank you, Peter. <coughs> well, everything has to have a beginning. Uh, we, our beginning began uh, in April of this year, and uh, it was with the pouring of the foundation. One of the things that we discovered with the old Musk Observatory and the new MDRS Robotic Observatory was that the flooring cracked, all right? And uh, so what we did is we put plenty of rebarb, or had uh, CC Construction put plenty of rebarb in so that would not occur again. Everything in a location like this is really a learning process. Um, this was an interesting scenario in our uh, attempt to get the observatory uh, from Lake Havasu City in Arizona. Uh, I think the picture uh, shows a, a temp if, if you could feel the, the temperature, I think it was 110 degrees when that image was taken. But we um, had a two-day delivery to Hanksville. The problem was that uh, they don't uh, deliver to Hanksville population 203 mm -hmm. unless the truck is completely filled. So it was going to be about two to maybe even three weeks before we got the observatory, and we were on our way out to get the observatory. CC Construction, which uh, did the uh, foundation, said, well, we've got a truck. We'll put it on the back of the truck and take it back to, uh, to Hanksville. And so this is the actual loading of the observatory onto the truck. They, uh, the, the guy who actually did the driving said every time he stopped for gas, it took him 20 to 30 minutes to get out of the station. The people were walking over and asking, what are you carrying on the back of your truck? Anyhow, so this was the delivery to MDRS. Uh, this is how it came off the truck, and uh, from that point, we um, disassembled the wood and uh, actually moved the observatory. Uh, I don't get into a lot of pictures because it's kind of like Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. You know, Neil had the camera, so all the pictures are of Buzz. Uh, I, I think that's me right there, okay? I'm, I'm not quite sure, okay? But 
Anyhow, we, we moved it over, uh, we uh, got it uh, stabilized onto the concrete pad, and life was good. In fact, this was all done within a period of about six or seven hours, to be quite honest with you. During that time period, we dug a, we, <laughs> CC Construction dug a trench, we laid, the, uh, we laid the electrical line into the observatory, and here we are, I think basically uh, maybe a day later, uh, with the observatory actually operational as a, as a unit. In other words, the dome's working, and a uh, good friend of mine and Pete's, uh, Adam Jones, who's I, is an IT specialist, came in, and he uh, provided a lot of the input in order to uh, make this happen with respect to making the computer work a lot easier. No, the observatory is not eating Peter. Uh, it's just Peter <laughs> sticking his head out of the observatory. Um, uh, we had Ed Tom Edward Thomas, okay, of uh, Deep Sky Products, who brought the, uh, the telescope up, but we decided not to put the telescope in because we didn't have the high-speed internet. And I don't know uh, how many of you have been to, well, there are a number of people who have been to MVRS, okay, but it, it can be a very quiescent place. It can be an incredibly windy and dusty place. So we, d we figured, let's leave the telescope out until we have the high-speed internet. We can put everything in and maybe save ourselves some cleaning projects uh, along the way. And so here we are, okay, with the observatory, uh, pointed towards a sunrise, waiting for high-speed internet. And we'll be able to put the rest of it together. Uh, we're hoping uh, in the next three or four weeks, because oh, we're, we're planning to get out there in October yeah, for, uh, the to, for the new season, that's correct, yes, okay. in order to be able to get the observatory. The feeling is now, I've used a lot of robotic telescopes, um, Australia, New Mexico, all sorts of different places. You get up at three o'clock in the morning, you get everything set up, and then you find out it's cloudy. Then you go back to bed, okay? And I've had students using them and they're always complaining, like, oh, that's, you know, it's part of the fun. You know, it's the nature of the game. You set up your filters, your, your uh, exposure times, and the whole bit. I looked at this and I thought, there are way too many moving pieces for a robotic, completely robotic observatory. Because the idea here is for someone to not just use this in the hab. I want people to use this at home. I want them to use it on a cruise ship if they have internet access. Anywhere where you got internet access, you should be able to use this observatory. And I found a group called Skynet, who was really into the Terminator series. And they, they built some software for this. They have telescopes all over the world that's part of this system, and we're going to be part of that family. I've used it successfully with my students. So how does it work? I have our students, or I have the crew members at MDRS. You guys are going to be top priority. You're priority one. There are three priority levels. So what's going to happen is sometime during the day, you're going to go online, and you're going to say, gee, you know, I want a picture of the Crab Nebula. I want to use this exposure. I want these filters. We're going to have two different telescopes. You get to choose your telescope for it. You get to choose what filters you want to use. And you hit submit. And that's it. You're done. That night, if it's clear, the telescope will go. It'll take your picture. It'll upload it to the internet. And you can catch it that night. Or you can wait till the next day or whenever you want to and download it and process it. And there it is. Moravian College, for their buy-in of $20,000, has 25% of the observing time. They will be priority two. Crew astronomers are priority one. They're priority two. So their students will be able to use the instruments as well. And then the rest, well, that goes to priority three users. That's going to be high school students and other people around the world who want to use this and can actually go and take images and download them onto their computer. The instrument we have is still a Celestron 14. It's a little higher quality than the last one. This is an edge, so it's got much better optics. It is meant for research. This is a research instrument. It is outfitted with UBVRI filters for doing top-rate photometric photometry. We can do all sorts of different types of activities with this, from exoplanets to variable stars to whatever you want to do. The other one is a tiny scope about this long. It's a stellar view. It doesn't look very big, but it gives you a really 
beautifully wide field. It is the smallest telescope in the Skynet family. It gives LRGB and H alpha filters color. This is your pretty picture camera. This is going to capture really beautiful shots of the Orion Nebula and Andromeda and the Helix Nebula, all sorts of wonderful things with this. This was a donation from a friend of ours, David Fisherowski. To use it, you can still go to program information. You can still go over to observatories. And you're going to see MDRS Robotic Observatory status coming October 2017. We expect the high-speed internet to come in soon. We expect to be out there in October. Once it's in, give me four days. Give me at least two clear nights. We're online. I don't know how. All I know is once I get everything set up and ready to go, I call some guy from Josh in North Carolina. I hook him up to the computer. He loads the program on and tests it. And he says within two minutes or two hours, magic happens. And all of a sudden, anyone in the world can use it. So looking forward to that. What you want to do now, at the bottom of this, there is also going to be a link. Click on Robotic Observatory. The link will be the first part of the quick guides. I have them ready to go, except I need pictures. I need actual info to complete it to put it up. But basically, the front of that guide is going to help you get started, because you will need a research proposal with this one. The first thing you want to do is figure out, what telescope do I want to use? Do I want to use the one for research? Do I want to use the one for the pretty pictures? This is actually what various objects would look like through each telescope. Just to give you an idea, we're looking at the Andromeda galaxy through this. You're only going to see the core. Here you can capture the whole thing. The Orion Nebula. It's gorgeous. And again, just the center. Size of the moon and the size of Jupiter. Obviously, you don't want to use either of these planets or either of these telescopes for planets. They are not planetary instruments. Robotic observatories never really are. Planets get to be really iffy. I'm going to need a really long focal length, and I really need you to be dead set on where you're looking in order to get a planet to look good through a robotic observatory. That's not easy. So there are going to be useful for anything else except for planets. Planetary imaging is going to be over as far as that goes. These are in black and white on purpose. That's the way they're going to come out. You're going to have to combine them together to make a color photo. Your research proposal is a big deal. That you can get to me now, even if you can't get any further on the instrument. I need your name, I need the crew number, I need what date you're going to be there. Give me a project title for your abstract. Tell me what telescope you're looking at. I know it's up there, but I just want to make sure that we're all in the same ballpark here. What objects are you planning to look at? I want to look at this exoplanet. I want to look at these asteroids, do an asteroid light curve. What software program are you using at home? Because you're going to have to be able to process some of this. And I can help you out perhaps with that, depending what program you have. And then your abstract. Give me 150, 300 words. Tell me what you want to do. Once that is approved, then we can move to the next step. Let's say you want to use the stellar view. You want to use the astrophotography. You have to write out the same proposal for that. If you want to use both, that's fine. Just give me two proposals. Tell me what you want to look at, what you want to do. We'll set you up. Once that's done, once that's finished, here's the test. I read this over. I like your abstract. We go through it. Everything is good. I now give you a couple minutes on the telescope. I log you in, and I give you a specific task. You're going to be able to go onto Skynet. You'll log in. You go to my observatory. This will say MDRS instead of Saratololo. You'll be able to put your objects in. You'll learn how to do that. We'll have all that there for you. That's in the quick guides. And then depending what you want to do, let's say you want to do an exoplanet. You're going to tell me what object you want to look at. So here's your test. Take a picture of it and get me a magnitude. Make a magnitude estimate using your software at home. Let me see that. Let me make sure that your magnitude estimates, everything's going to be right and good. Once you have that, you're set and ready. So by the time you're ready to use the telescope, you've already made your first observation from home. You're there. Astrophotography, just take a pretty picture of something. 
and three filters, combine it together, let's see what we have. Uh, Dave Fischerowski did that. That's uh, look, taking filters, putting them together for the uh, Trifid Nebula. Once you convert that to color, you already know how to use the instrument. You're ready to go, and I'll get you more time. Any instrument like this is going to need bias, dark, and flat fields. We call these calibration frames. This is the real pain when it comes to this stuff. You don't have to deal with that for the most part because this will be done automatically for you. We're going to take masters of each of those, but you're going to have to download those and subtract those from your image. You definitely want to do that for photography, or yet for photography and definitely for photometry, especially to get good estimates. Again, in the quick guides, it will teach you how to do that. The laptop we have out there has Maxim DL on it. So if you're out there and you know how to use Maxim DL, you can process your images, you can do it with that. If you have it at home and using it, that's fine. If you're using a different software program at home, you love it, Canopus, AIP, Win4, whatever, bring it along in your laptop and just use that instead. Use whatever you're familiar with. So what happens when you're done at MDRS? You had your two weeks, you had four clear nights, right? You didn't get a whole lot of data. Ask for more time in the telescope. Continue to use it. I will give you time in the telescope. Hey, here's uh, some more minutes, here's another hour, depending on what you want to do. Just keep in mind, you went from level one at MDRS now to level three, okay, at home. So it may take a day or two, depending, before you get your images back. But you can keep using it. That's the beauty of the system. So, much thanks to the people who are out there. Our astronomy refit crew, we go out every year to help uh, straighten some things up. We had quite a few people coming out this past year. Including Rogue the dog. <laughs> and especially to Ed Thomas from Deep Space Products, who helped me uh, coordinate most of the gear together and getting all that stuff in. Any questions? This was actually my son's question, but with the new clamshell observatory, how does one get into it? Are you climbing in? <laughs> I, I, don't, I didn't see a hat. So. There is no door. Okay. We don't want anybody in there. That's the beauty of it. You're not going out so to the observatory. these guys setting it up and they're climbing in and out. I'm climbing in and out. Robotic, it doesn't I have been trapped in that thing three times this summer. <laughs> <laughs> or I've had to be extracted and taking bolts and everything else out and just like, I was the guy that let them out. <laughs> I'm like three times, really, the thing just kind of, oh, we got it figured out now. We got all so the bugs worked out. It's, it's you, you can't walk in, no. Yeah. No one's visiting the observatory at all. Okay. You just work it from wherever you're at. Given that Elon Musk kind of got this whole thing rolling, have you been able to brief Elon or his team on what you guys have accomplished since then? I was able to thank him one time when he was at a conference. I got a chance to meet him and talk with him. But uh, he was giving some money off to different things and Real happy to do that, and we were real proud to be able to have that. What you've been able to do in the last yeah, that, that's Robert who takes care of all the funding and all that good stuff for us. So well, one other technical question: I was just in Oregon watching the total eclipse of the sun with your hydrogen alpha telescope. Is there any advantage to seeing the outer corona with that telescope in a total eclipse? No, not for a total eclipse. That's for the uh, chromosphere only. They will not be able to catch the corona. Won't be able to pull that off. And I'll Can take your question. One more thing. But in 2023, yeah. there's an annular eclipse that goes right over MDRS. Wow. And that'll be wonderful. Should be. Where's one last. Hanksville in Where is that? Uh, Hanksville. What about it? Where's it located? Where's Hanksville located in the middle of nowhere. Eastern <laughs> Utah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the middle of nowhere. Stop. Just south of Goblin Valley. Yeah. <laughs> 